So, there's an elephant in the room I need to address. <laughs> I was here about a month ago, and I told you a story yes. about how I went to a Halloween party, and I forgot to finish the story. <laughs> yes. And don't worry, because all of you reminded me on your way out that I forgot to finish the story. <laughs> So much so, like, did I talk about anything else or just this one story? That was all, that's all people remember. And I was thinking about coming up here and telling you how the story ends, but the more I thought about it, I have a better idea. I am randomly going to tell you the end of the story. You just have to make sure you're here every Sunday because you don't know when it's going to be. <laughs> so in three years, you'll hear the end of the story, but make sure you're here every week. And if you want to hear the name of it, you can find me at the end. Uh, the, the two of you that showed up at my house asking, though, if this is weird. Uh, I am excited to be back with you all today. If you've been with us, we've been looking at the life of a guy named Moses. And looking at some of the most important and big moments of his life. I'm excited to continue to walk through that journey with you. But to set up where we're going today... I and a couple of my pastor friends about seven years ago or so took a trip to a conference very far in a place called Indiana. Now, if you're from Indiana, God bless you. God loves you. You need Jesus, though. That place I hate God loves. So we took a trip out to Indiana, and on our way to the trip, in the airport, we saw a man, a, a pretty large man, wearing a spandex shirt on that was clearly about three sizes too small for this guy. <laughs> so we were just, we were laughing, we were joking, and, and we kind of moved on. We get to the place we're going, I don't want to say the name of it again because it just doesn't sound good. We get to the hotel, and as I get into my room, I have my own room, I saw that on my bed, my buddy Mike, who was a pastor as well, bought me my very own small spandex shirt. <laughs> and it was just sitting on my bed. And I laughed, I thought it was funny, but a couple hours later, I was just looking at the box, thinking, I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna try it. So I grabbed the box, and on the back of it, it had instructions on how to put the box on, which was great, because this shirt did not belong on my body. <laughs> It said, looking good has never been easier. I put the box, put the shirt on, and very simple instructions. I opened the box, I put the shirt on. And let me tell you what, looking good has been easier for me. Because <laughs> when I looked in the mirror, the shirt got about here, and then became like a giant rubber band, and I couldn't go to do with it. This shirt, I began to sweat because this shirt is just like constricting me. The good news was, the back of the box also had instructions on how to take the shirt off. I needed that. The problem was, it didn't work. Every single one of the instructions, I couldn't figure it out. So I'm now like in full-blown panic attack. I've got this shirt on, I can't get it off. The more I sweat, the harder it is to get it off because it's stuck to my body. I look in the mirror, I'm like, You're, what are you doing? You're like, look at yourself. And I, for legitimately about 25 minutes, could not figure out how to get this shirt off. And so I finally was able to rip into the shirt, I ripped the shirt off, I about sad, I had a panic attack, I jumped in the shower, and I'm like, what, what, what just happened? I, I tell you that story because, looking back, at any point in my experience with this shirt, I simply could have walked out of my room, knocked on my friend's door, who bought me the shirt, with this beautiful shirt on, saying, Hey man, <laughs> tried the shirt on, <laughs> looks good. Uh, can, can you help me get this thing off? Because <laughs> I can't figure this out. <laughs> and, and as I was thinking about our time this morning, the reason I didn't do that, the reason I refused to knock on his door and ask him <laughs> to help me take that shirt off, is the very thing I want to talk to you about this morning. It's the very thing. I think all of us in the room struggle with from time to time, and it's this. I was afraid of being vulnerable and what he would think if he saw what I looked like. I was afraid of being vulnerable 
and what he might think if he saw what I looked like. Here's, if I could wrap up what we're going to talk about this morning in one sentence. It, it's pretty simple, but it's, it's a big idea that all of us in the room, I think it's one of the most important parts of being a follower of Jesus. And it's this. You cannot win alone. You cannot win alone. The more we try to do life alone, without God, without others, the more you will find yourself like me, in a panic, feeling isolated, and feeling frustrated with your circumstances. Moses. This is something Moses completely understood, that we cannot win alone. And we're going to look at an entire chapter of the Bible. We see two different versions of Moses realizing you cannot win alone. And my hope and my prayer for you is that you will see in this story that you cannot do this alone. If you have a Bible, go to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. If you don't know where the book of Exodus is, it's the second book of the Bible. Really easy to find. If you still can't find it, God put a table of context at the beginning. Look for Exodus. Pretty easy to find. Exodus chapter 17. If you're new to Christianity or you're new to the Bible, I want to catch you up to speed because we're jumping into the middle of a story. And I want to make sure you know how the context of what's happening. If you, if you understand Christianity, you know the first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. It says that God created. God created. God put everything into motion. Page 2 of the Bible. God created us. He created people. He created Adam who literally picked up the dust and breathed life into people. He saw Adam and said, I think I can do better. So he created a woman. <laughs> can I get an amen, women? Amen. Don't get too excited. Ruth's about to come up in this story and you don't look good at that point. Don't get too excited. <laughs> God created people. See, you and I, we were literally created to be in community with God in community with others. That is literally why we've been put on this earth. To be in relationship with God and relationship with each other. Chapter 3 of the Bible. God puts a tree. There's fruit. He says, you have one rule. You can do whatever you want. Don't eat the tree. Why would you do that? Well, because God chose love. And you cannot have love without a choice. So God gave them a choice. And they broke the one rule that God, that God said. Here's what happens with sin. Here's what sin does. I talk about this all the time. What sin does is it breaks the very thing we were created to do. It breaks our relationship with God, and it breaks our relationship with each other. What we see from that moment is God had a plan to fix this sin problem. And he picked one man, and he said, through this man, through this one family, I am going to change Change the world. The family gets, gets bigger. The family grows. And the guy had a coat of many colors. Some of you know the story. Finds himself in Egypt. The most powerful known place at the time. Through circumstances we don't have time to get into. He becomes one of the most powerful men in this, this country. He brings all of God's people, the Israelites, to come into Egypt and live there. And the people begin to grow. And become larger. The problem was the pharaoh, the, the king, if you will, of Egypt, did not want the Egyptians mingling with the Israelites. So there was basically an entire group of nation living within the nation. And these people were beaten. They were taken advantage of. And God had enough. So he goes to a man named Moses, the guy we're going to look at. And says, through you, I'm going to bring my people from slavery to freedom. And church, if you don't know this yet, God is still in the business of taking people from slavery to freedom. He goes to Moses. Moses has ten plagues come. They go on a journey. They're in the wilderness. On their way to the promised land that God said they're going to deliver. And in chapter 16, right before this, they realize... They're getting kind of hungry. So they're in the wilderness and they're complaining to Moses saying, hey Moses, 
we need food. Like, there's a million people, there's all these animals, these kids, we need food. So Moses goes to God and says, God, what are we going to do? We need food. And God says, go to sleep, wake up. When you wake up, there's going to be Pop-Tarts everywhere around you. <laughs> so they wake up and there's Pop-Tarts, and you just choose frosting or no frosting. It's totally up to you. The, the biblical word is manna, but I, in English, Pop-Tarts. Same thing. <laughs> the problem was, these Pop-Tarts would go bad after 24 hours. So every day you have to wake up, and you have to trust that I'm going to provide more Pop-Tarts for you. The people are happy. Problem is, they eat you so many Pop-Tarts, now they need something to wash it down with. So they have another problem. Gets us to Exodus chapter 17. Here's what it says. All of the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. If you don't know how to say a word in the Bible, by the way, just like say it confidently, and everyone will think you nailed it. That's just a thing I learned about the but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. The people have finally got food from God, but they're at a point where they have no water. They need to rely on God. So they go to Moses complaining. They go to Moses and go, hey, we've got Pop-Tarts, but we got no water. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? I love this response because it shows us a little bit of the heart of Moses. Moses says, why are you coming to me? I didn't provide the manna. Why are you coming to me? I didn't provide the plates. I'm not the one who did any of this. I'm simply taking cues from God. Moses understood that this is not possible without, without God. But the people thirst there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock of thirst. So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Yikes. Have you been there? I, we all know we have enemies outside of our camp. Have you been there? Where it feels like even the people in our own camp are against us. Have you been in a moment where you're like, Wait, we're on the same team here. Why are you coming after me? Oh, it's so easy, Christians, to say, well, we have an enemy, and that's our problem. But the reality is, so often, we are stoning each other in our own camp. And Moses is going, what, what's going on? Why is there so much fighting among us? Moses turns to God and says, God, I need your help. I need you to show up. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, take you with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in the hand, take your hand, the staff in which you struck the Nile, go. Behold, I will stand before you there on a rock in Horeb. No idea if that's how you say it, but I'm going to go with it. And you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it. And the people will drink, and Moses did so, in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the names of the place Massa and Meribah. Because of the quarreling of the people of Israel. Because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord not among us? I love this. And I say this almost every time I'm here. And as long as I come, you're going to hear some version of this. Sometimes following Jesus is simply that easy. God tells you to do it and you go and do it. God simply told him, here's what I need you to do. And Moses did it. Following God is often that simple. I didn't say didn't say that's easy. It's hard doing what God says. But it's often that simple. God said to do it, so he went and he did it. He understood who he had to listen to. He understood who was in control. Okay, here's where the story gets crazy. Next verse. Then... The Elimachites, these are the these are people who hated the Israelites, came to fight with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men. Choose some men and go out and fight them. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with my staff of God in my hand. Oh, okay. 
The Israelites are sleeping. They finally got what they wanted from God. While they're sleeping, their enemy comes. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, it says the enemy came from behind them and started taking out the weak first. These people hated them because of who their God was. And we've got a battle about to happen. And what does Moses do? He goes and gets his staff. Now, the staff that Moses has, this thing is awesome. If you know anything about the Old Testament, this thing is such a cool magic trick at a party. The first time Moses and God interact, he says, how are people going to know I'm from with you, God? And God says, what's in your hand? He's like, stick. God says, throw it on the ground, see what happens. He puts the stick on the ground and becomes a snake. <laughs> The crazy part to me, the Bible doesn't say how we ever picked it back up. If this thing became a stick, I'd be like, I'm good. I don't need it anymore. But somehow he grabbed the thing, and it became a stick again. This thing is how they crossed the Nile, what we just saw. He simply stuck it out. You've seen the picture where he holds the staff, and the Nile, Nile parts. The enemy. The Red Sea, thank you. The Red Sea. Oh, damn, that was great. Thanks, Kipper. <laughs> he does it to me too. No worries. Sure. <laughs> At this point in the story, an enemy has come to wipe them out. And Moses says, I'm getting the stick. He goes up on top of a hill with his stick. <laughs> he takes the stick. And here's what he does he simply goes, That's it. <laughs> and I read this story, I'm like, that's it? You, you, like, I would like turn that thing on and like start going for people. I don't know, like do something with the thing. What's crazy is he just puts it above his head, but nowhere in the Bible does it say God told him to do that. He just got up there and was like, <laughs> what's more crazy is when he had the stick above his head, Joshua and his men would win the battle. So he's sitting there going, as he puts his hands down, they begin to lose. Can you picture the scene? Keep in mind, he's in his 80s at this point. He's standing there going, yeah. <laughs> he's like, uh-oh, what am I going to do? He keeps in the air, <coughs> shake but Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. So Moses, 80 years old, is sitting there holding it up going, I didn't think this one through. What am I going to do? So someone's nice enough, gets him a stone, and he sits on it, and he's just like, oh, it's going to be a long night. Have you ever tried to hold anything above your head for more than, like, five seconds? At the church I work at, we had uh, 12 Easter services. And the first service, they this one of our worship leaders sang this song. It was a beautiful uh like reversion of a Christian song, and it was like the talk of the town. So I go in for the second service to watch it, and I want to make sure I recorded it. So I grab my phone that weighs about, I don't know, nothing, and I held it above my head to record her sin. <clears throat> After about eight seconds, I'm like, man, this phone is heavy. <laughs> After two minutes, I'm like, wrap it up. The song should be over by now. I can't do it anymore. At three minutes, I'm like, I got enough. I don't need any more of this. I, I tapped out. I couldn't keep doing it. 80-year-old Moses is holding a stick until sunset, it says. Until sunset. They pull up a chair. He sits on it, thinking, oh, it's going to be a long night. As he sat on it, next verse, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on each side, and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until they're going down the sun. Okay, here we go. This is crazy. He's standing here. He's holding it up. He realizes this is the only way we're going to win. I need some help. Here comes two guys with him. And I know what you're thinking. If you just read the story, you don't understand context. You think Moses got two, like, 25-year-old buff-looking guys that look not like me. That's not what happened. He got Aaron and her. Moses is 80 years old. Aaron is his older brother. <laughs> older brother. Her. Her is married to Moses and Aaron's older sister. <laughs> These dudes are close to 100. I don't know how they could have got better help. These are the people they said. They're walking up like, oh, he needs help. My turn. 
and the three of them, until the sun goes down, hold the stick in the air. <laughs> Verse 13, and Joshua was overwhelmed, and his people with the sword, and the Lord said to Moses, write this down so they win the fight. Because Moses had help, Moses had help keeping the stick up. He understood he couldn't do it alone. Moses got help and they won the fight. The Lord said to Moses, write this down as memorable in the book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. That I will utterly blow out the memory of Amalekite from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with the Lamechites for generation to generation. This is the first time yet in the entire scripture that God says, I need you to write this one down. This is a story you need to write down. And Moses understood. He cannot win the fight by himself. He had to get help around him. I love this, this scripture. I love these two stories right next to each other because I don't think they happen back to back without reason. The first part, we see Moses needing to solely rely on God. See, you cannot do it without God. I said you cannot win alone, you cannot win without God. Here's what so many of us do though. We go to God and say, I want to win with my finances. But God says, that's the problem. They're your finances. They're not mine. We go to God and say, God, I want to win in my relationships. And God says, that's the problem. They're your relationships. They're not mine. We go to God and say, I want to win in my career. And God goes, that's the problem. It's your career. It's not mine. You cannot win without God. And the first half of the story is the people realizing they are completely dependent on our Heavenly Father. The second half of the story, we see that Moses is completely dependent on others. See, not only can you not win without God, you cannot win without people. You and I were not created to do this alone. Thanks. I got to appreciate that. Did you drink out of it? Not yet. Good. Not yet. It's good. You were not created to do this alone. You cannot win alone. You cannot win without God, without others. Like I said up front, you were created to be connected to God and connected to others. That is how you were designed to live. And Moses, Moses understood that. I want to close by looking at one verse of you. Years later, hundreds of years later, in the New Testament, one of Jesus' closest friends, Peter, writes something down that is so on the nose of what we're talking about. He says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. Do you know how lions hunt? It's pretty cool. How it works is they go after a gazelle, and the female lions are the ones that do the hunting. The guys are they're, they're in bed, they're walking football, I don't know what they're doing. They're a pretty good lion. Because the female lions do everything. How it works is they go after a pack of gazelles. It's so cool how Peter connects these dots. They go after a pack of gazelles, and what the female lions try to do is they try to isolate. They try to get them away from the pack. Once they find a way to get a gazelle away from the pack, here's what a gazelle does. It looks for a bush to jump into. So at this point, a gazelle will jump into a bush, and the lions cannot get to the gazelle because it's covered by the bush. So here's what happens. The female lion, realizing what's going on, goes and gets the male lion. The male lion shows up. He's got one job and one job only, to roar. <laughs> All he's trying to do is scare the gazelle so much so, it'll leave its protection and find itself in the jaws of the lion. 
Have you ever heard a male lion roar? A couple years ago, I went to a zoo in Prescott, and it's like a, it's a very small zoo, but it's known for this, this lion they have there. And I, and I walk up to it, and this thing just, this thing looks like it's looking at me like I'm just smacking this thing. And in between me and this line, legitimately, we're like this close to each other, is a fence about this big. <laughs> and I grabbed one of the workers and I was like, hey, is, am I safe? Like, can't it destroy this? He's like, oh yeah. He could destroy that cage with one slide. I was like, okay. <laughs> He's like, you no, know, you're fine. Because the line doesn't know that. It thinks it can't break through. So because I'm me, I begin to talk this line. Once I realize I'm completely safe. So I'm sitting there like, hey, kitty, 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 come here. <laughs> My wife's just like, oh, why am I bring in public again? And I'm just like, come on. <laughs> this line just looks up and roars. And it was one of the scariest, coolest things I've ever heard. Peter says, we have an enemy. We have an enemy that goes around like a roaring lion. We have an enemy going around speaking lies. We have an enemy trying to isolate you, trying to get you alone so he can take you out. You and I were named and connected to God and connected to others. And we have an enemy that his goal is to get you isolated from God and isolated from others. And my, my fear is, you, my fear is you're looking a lot like I did in that hotel in Indiana. We are alone, frustrated, and you're tired of trying to do this by yourself. Church, you are not meant to do this alone. You are not meant to be alone. You are meant to be connected to your Heavenly Father. And in that, you are meant to be connected to those around you. It's how you were created to live. I'd love to pray for you. We're going to sing one more song together. Father, thank you for your grace. Father, thank you that you are a God that we can depend on. Thank you that you are a God that does provide for us. Father, I pray in moments where we feel like, are you even listening? Are you even here? I pray that we will keep our trust and our eyes on you. Father, for those of us in the room, with our finances, with our relationships, with our career, I pray that we'll hand those things over to you because we cannot win if you're not in it. And Father, for so many of us in the room, we try to do this alone. We don't let people see the real us. We are too afraid to ask for help. We're too afraid to let people see who we really are. Father, I pray that you'll give us courage. You'll give us the courage to be vulnerable, to be in relationship with others, because that's how you define it. Father, we, we know we have an enemy that wants nothing more than for us to be alone, wants nothing more for us to be disconnected. So Father, I pray that all of us Father, all of us will take covering and be connected to you and connected to others. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.